mouth and meditation of my heart, ever I will be the Lord, my strength and my salvation. Amen. Amen. Would you please be seated? Henry, would you mind shutting those doors so that my I like to hear my voice coming back at me from the wall, and then when the doors open, they shoot right outside. <laughs> This is Pentecost Sunday, that's why I wear red. The altar, altar hangings are all red. This is the day the church celebrates the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So what better day than to start off by telling a joke about the Holy Spirit? <laughs> it's an old one, you've heard it many times, but it gets better with passing, I think. Well, at least that's my father's theory, because he tells me the same joke every week. There were three men in an inn. The Pope, Billy Graham, and Oral Roberts were off on a golfing outing. You know, clergy don't do much of anything during the week. <laughs> <laughs> so they have plenty of time to take in the sights and get a few rounds of golf in. And they're on, they're flying off and wham, right into the side of a the mountain they flew, and they all die. And the Pope and Billy Graham and Oral Roberts all went up to heaven. They all stood before the pearly gates in St. Peter. And St. Peter opened the book of life, and he ran his finger down the list of today's people coming to heaven. And he looked up, and he looked down, and he looked back, and he paged forward a few pages. Fellas, we've got a problem. That plane crash is supposed to happen on the way home from your vacation, not today. So you're dead a week early, but I can't, I, you can't come in. Because your reservation's not for another week. <laughs> and you can't go back to life because you're dead. And this is a Protestant story, so there's no purgatory. So there's <laughs> one other place to go, and that's hell. So I'm going to have to send you to hell for a week. But when you're done, I want to hear what exactly you did when you were in hell. So the Pope and Billy Graham and Will Roberts, they all went to hell. A week later, they came back before St. Peter. And St. Peter said to, Frank, to the Pope, Brother, what did you do when you were in hell? And the Pope put his hands together and he bowed his head. And he said, On that first day, I built an altar. And every day, I celebrated the sacraments. And I had a monstrance with the Holy, the Blessed Sacrament in the center. And I would march around all of hell calling all the sinners, all the fallen, all the lost, to come, make their confession, receive Holy Communion, and by doing so, they will be saved. St. Peter said, what happened? Well, on that last night in hell, I may have called all those who believed to come and make their confession, <clears throat> receive the body and blood of Christ, and save them got up, made his confession, received the hosts. I forgave Satan. Satan has been saved. <laughs> well, St. Peter was very impressed by this. He said, brother, you come into the kingdom. You come into the glory. And then he asked Billy Graham, brother, what did you do when you were in hell? And Billy Graham said, on that first night, I put up a tent. And every night I preached, and I preached, and I preached to all the demons in hell, and to all the lost sinners, and to Satan. And I shared with them the pure word of God. And St. Peter said, yes, what happened? On that last night, Billy Graham said, I made an altar call, and I said, Satan, now is the hour of decision. Satan, now is the moment you must decide where you will spend all eternity. Satan got up, confessed the name of Jesus, and came forward and answered the altar call. And Satan was saved. St. Peter was very impressed by this. He said, brother, you come into the kingdom, you come into the glory. And so Oral Roberts, that great Pentecostal minister, was asked to come forward and give an account of his time in hell. And Oral Roberts said, on that first night of saints in hell, I prayed and I prayed and I prayed, and I called down the blood of Jesus on all those 
those demons in hell. And I ask the Holy Spirit to fill me and everybody here. St. Peter said, yes, what happened? And Oral Roberts said, in a week I've made enough money to put in air conditioning. <laughs> <laughs> That's an Episcopalian joke. <laughs> Why is it an Episcopalian joke? Well, we believe in the efficacy of the sacraments. When you receive the body and blood of Jesus Christ, you are becoming at one with the communion of saints, Christians past, Christians present, Christians future. The sacraments are a door into eternity. We are a Catholic church in that sense. We are a Protestant church also, in that we believe that faith comes by hearing. Hearing what? The Word of God. But when it comes to the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, we're not so sure we want to go down that road. Because the Holy Spirit, that's what charlatans talk about. People with bad hair and bad suits on cable TV say, put your hands on the TV screen. Send me a hundred and God will send you a thousand by the power of the Holy Spirit. We don't want anything to do with that. And quite rightly so. But it is the power of the Holy Spirit that is God at work in the world today. And if we neglect that, we neglect that in our peril. Now, there's so much to talk about by the power of the Holy Spirit and by strength. And I only, I just have so little time. But this is the day in the life of the church when the Spirit came in, as we read in our first reading of the books of Acts, and filled all believers. And in essence, the church, by that power, was brought alive and continues to this day. And Paul, in his letter to the Corinthians, talks about this Spirit. And he talks about the spiritual gifts given to believers. But I want to focus on one little refrain that Paul keeps making in his letter to the Corinthians. And it begins, he keeps going on, one Lord, varieties of service, varieties of gifts, one Lord, one Spirit. <coughs> All these are activated by one and the same Spirit who allots to us each one individually, just as the Spirit chooses. <clears throat> Paul keeps hammering on one Holy Spirit. Lots of everything else, but one Spirit. Well, for us, that's sort of like, yeah, 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 well, let's get to the good stuff. What is he trying to say here? Well, let's just stop for a second. You and I live in an era since the 4th century when the church, the Cappadocian Fathers, St. Athanasius, did the heavy lifting and defined the doctrine of the Trinity and the Holy Spirit. We know what Paul is talking about. But did those first Jews, those first Greeks who were hearing God's word, know what he was meant? Because in their world, there are lots of evil spirits. Shouldn't there be lots of good spirits? Shouldn't there be spirits, what we, Paul is talking about, having the gift in the, from the spirit of healing, the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of wisdom. Aren't these all individual spirits, just like they're individual demons? Jesus is casting out demons all the time. It's a different demon each time. Why shouldn't there be a spirit for each gift? And Paul is nailing that door shut, saying, no, no, no. There is but one Spirit, many manifestations, but one God. Now, why is he doing this? What is the point? Because this is a rather mildly academic, interesting point, but what's going on here? How does this apply to our life today? Well, the church in Corinth was a mess. They were divided into factions. I'm for Paul, I'm for Apollos, I'm for this guy, I'm for that guy. They were a church that was out of order. They, they allowed people basically to do whatever they wanted to do. Why was that? Because each of the people claimed, the Spirit is speaking to me. The Spirit is speaking to me, and I'm on Apollos' side. And the Spirit is, but I'm Spirit speaking to me too, and I'm on Paul's team. And what Paul is saying is, friends, this factionalism, is evidence of itself that the Spirit is absent. Because there's only one Holy Spirit. And not a lot of them. 
and there are certain non-negotiable things on the top that all profess the name of Jesus Christ must share. The first is the first thing he says. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, somebody can say it, but meaning it, understanding it, living it. You cannot be in the power of the Spirit just because you say so, but by the working of the Spirit's in your life. Paul is talking to a divided, broken church at factions, at, uh, at enmity with each other, and he is telling them, folks, we need to stand together. There are certain things that we are free to disagree on, that we can have our own opinions and go our own ways and think our own thoughts, but there are certain things that are non-negotiable. And it begins with the divinity and lordship of Jesus Christ. Our church, the Episcopal Church, has not had as good, I like to make things sound great, but we've had a problem with this. I, ha I grew up before we moved to Florida as a little boy. I grew up in a church in the Philadelphia suburbs that was a beautiful 19th century Gothic suburban Pennsylvania church. And it had a second floor gallery. Do you know what that gallery was called? The Slave Gallery. Why? Because that's where all the black people sat. Now the white people sat downstairs. There may be no Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, but there were certainly blacks and whites. And they sat upstairs and we sat downstairs. When I moved to Florida and I started my ministry, there are two Episcopal churches in Fort Pierce, three blocks apart. Why do you have St. Andrews here and St. Simon the Cyrene there, built in the 1920s? Oh, one's for white people, one's for black people. That's our heritage. And part of the last hundred years has been breaking this sense that we cannot be one in Christ if we are a different color, or a different culture, or a different, just different. We have Erin who preached last night. Erin's the girl with cerebral palsy. And part of her life's journey as a Christian has basically been people not looking at her as a freak. Well, shouldn't you be off in your own little closet, you know, doing your own little thing with people like yourself? Because you make faces and you have clicks and jerks and noises, and you're distracting. Now, you and I may think that's awful. How tacky can people be? But people have an infinite ability to be unkind. How do you live? How do we as Christians live? Well, we start with the basic non-negotiables. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second commandment is like unto it. Jesus said, love your neighbors yourself. Now we ask ourselves, who is our neighbor? And we're told to love our enemies. Well, you know, on one level, it's it's easy for me, I love the people of ISIS, and I want them to be converted, because I'm never going to see them. It's a nice thought, pious thoughts that I really don't have to take seriously in my life. But if you ask me to love my evil Aunt Carol, <laughs> whoa, I don't know if I'm going to go there, man. <laughs> you start with those around you. Loving your neighbor, loving your family, loving the people around you as yourself, treating them with respect, with dignity, not as Greeks or Jews, slaves or free, male or female, but as people created in the image of God and beloved by God. That's non-negotiable. Now our church has done a few things right. Wars of religion destroyed Europe all throughout the 1600s. And the Church of England was subject to the same stresses. And so what did we decide to do on um, what happens at Holy Communion? What happens? If you're a Roman Catholic, you believe in the real presence. That the body and blood of Christ is truly presence. The outward form has changed, but it's truly the body and blood of Christ. And if you don't believe that, you're not truly receiving Holy Communion, therefore you're not partaking in the sacraments, therefore you're going to go to hell. So if you don't believe the right thing, you're going to go to hell. 
Two, this is purely spiritual and symbolic. This is symbolism. It's still bread, it's still wine, it's nothing else, but we think about it in pious ways. To the middle version, which came up with Martin Luther, which is, this changes into bread and wine, and body and blood, changes into bread and wine, but only spiritually. So what did we decide as Episcopalians to do? Well, we believe all three. <laughs> and if you listen to our communion service very closely, we have three paragraphs in a row that talk about the real presence, that talk about the spiritual presence, and then talk about the symbolism of it all. We've decided not to force the issue because none of us have the wisdom to know the mystery of God. This sort of issue is what Paul is saying to the people in common. The power of the Holy Spirit is claimed by some people as, as the right to be the, you know, God told me, therefore you've got to do what I say. And Paul's saying that's not how God works. The power of the Holy Spirit is made manifest by the fruits of the Spirit. The gifts are given for the building, not of your own ego, but for the community of Christian believers. And there are some things which we're just not going to be able to decide amongst ourselves. It's taken 500 years for the Episcopal Church to decide what happens in the second half of the service. And I don't think we've reached any conclusion. <laughs> so when we're faced with these issues that are so destructive and dividing, sometimes we need just to step back and say, perhaps it is not of our time to be the ones to come up with the final answer. It's hard. Oh, sometimes I wish I was Catholic. Do you know why? Then I could tell Ron what to do. And, <laughs> and, and if, the, uh, if the offering was a little light, I could send it around a second time and say, Ron, come on now, fella. You're not going to go to hell unless you're going to go to hell if you don't do it. Well, you know, that's not how the Episcopal Church works. We're not, how do I would describe it, as a theocracy where there's the Pope and the Bishop and the Priest and then everybody else. We are a communitarian type church, meaning there are minist lay ordained ministers. There are lay ministers. They're the people of God, and all are equal in the sight of God. We each have different purposes and functions. I am ordained or consecrated to preach and to celebrate the sacraments. That is a specific role given to me. But that doesn't make me a better Christian. It just gives me a different task. Each of us interpret and see and feel and respond to the Holy Spirit acting in our own lives according to our own lights. We're all individuals and God will work differently through each of us. And we may not agree. Give you a little, a tiny little, I never go off the topic here. <laughs> I was in the newspapers last month a few times. I've got friends who are still in the media and they all wanted to know about the new uh, Supreme Court Justice, Neil Gorsuch. Neil Gorsuch uh, goes to St. John's Episcopal Church in Boulder, Colorado, and some intrepid reporters looked up the priest there, a woman priest, and she has all these sermons about gun control and this and that. And they said, is this guy a secret liberal? Because <laughs> he goes to a church with a female priest who's way out there. I said, I don't think anybody in it who goes to an Episcopal church cares one whit about the politics of their minister. You can't say that because somebody goes there, they're just like their priest. The priest is one of many people in that congregation. Now, if it was a church dedicated to gun control, that's different. But that's that woman's opinion. But what we do in the service is worship Jesus Christ. So you can't pull anything, you know, in terms of politics about where somebody goes to a church if they go to an Episcopal church. Because I truly would be shocked if everybody agreed with me on every single issue here. <laughs> 
except for Ron, you, we, we're, we're blind. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. We don't have to agree to be brothers and sisters in Christ. We shouldn't demand that power over other people. What we need, what, what we must demand as Christians is to love one another. Treat other people, races, colors, abilities, genders, you know the list, with dignity as people created in the image of God. We've grown out of the past of having certain things reserved for certain types of people. That's the past. Today, all are equal in the sight of God. Amen. Friends, would you please stand?